Hello and welcome to our presentation of the actuarial evaluation of the XYZ pension scheme. There are 968 members in this scheme which we have evaluated. These members are categorised under three different headings, actives, deferreds and pensioners. The proportion of members in each group is shown in this pie chart. The groups are then further subdivided according to the pension increases which they are entitled to receive and the category to which they belong. This graph represents the members in each category and which group they belong to. We will now move on and talk about the assumptions we made while considering the valuation of the XYZ pension scheme and the reasons why these assumptions were necessary. Firstly, we will look at RPI. RPI is a measure of inflation. To calculate a long run RPI value, we averaged out the previous year's RPI's data to give us a value of 3.56%. We then um, looked at salary growth. We presume that all members are part of the same company and we are consultants working on behalf of this company. The correlation between age and presumably their experience and salary of our active members is shown in this graph. We assumed an average starting salary of around 34,000 and an average salary after 20 years to linearly calculate a salary growth of 4.45%. This appears to be accurate for the given data and is consistent with our inflation presumption. We also assume that salaries are averaged out over one year. We then moved on to look at interest rates. We assumed the post-retirement interest rate to be 6.2% based on previous year's records. To account for interest accurately in a pension scheme, we came across financial reporting standard 17, which recommends using an interest rate similar to that of a long-run AA-rated corporate bond, which will prevent large surpluses or, more critically, a large deficit. We find details of five long-term bonds and correlated the yield and duration from this graph, we were able to forecast a yield for a 30-year bond. This turned out to be 6.3%, which we adjusted to 6.2% to allow for prudence. We based our pre-retirement interest rate on the assumption that the pre-retirement period allows more time for us to profit on payments into the scheme before they need to be partially returned. This will allow us to invest in less liquid assets, as there is little demand on re immediate return of funds. Less liquid assets are typically deemed risk to be more to be riskier and thus provide a higher return on capital. To allow for this, we added a 1% to the interest figure above to determine our pre-retirement rate, giving us a pre-retirement interest rate of 7.2%. All of these assumptions have been have, have been recorded in this table. I think we're going to record it again. Right. We then moved on to mortality rates. We calculated the following mortality rates using the PMA92 and PFA92 tables as our basis. We then used the Northern Ireland mortality rates from the National Statistics website to work out the current life expectancies, and we used this information to adjust the PMA92 and PM PFA92 PFA tables as shown below. The adjustments we need the adjustments we made to the mortality of pre-retired males is minus four, pre-retired females minus three, post-retired males minus two, post-retired females minus two. It was necessary to do this as life expectancy has increased since when these tables were first calculated. When doing these calculations, we discovered some errors in our data. Four of the members in the pensioners category were listed as aged 110 and were all given the same date of birth. In order to be prudent with the data, we took the ages of these individuals to be 65 so as to not underestimate the total liabilities of the scheme. We then looked at the proportion married of the members in the scheme. Um, the proportion of married males was taken to be 80% and the proportion of married females was taken to be 70% after collating data from the 2001 Northern Irish Census. Um, we're now going to talk about the liabilities of the scheme. Um, we calculated these using software called SuperVal. Uh, we input all the assumptions that Claire has already discussed and uh, this is the results we came out with. So you can see that the total liabilities for the scheme is around 122 million and uh, the assets currently held um, by the scheme are 75 million. 
So that means that we have a deficit of around 47 million and the funding level at the moment is only at 61.3%. Um, the assets held by the company um, at the moment are wholly invested in equity. Uh, this is an inappropriate way of investing the contributions made to the scheme because equities are a very volatile investment. Uh, the value of shares has been lower in recent years due to the recession and also due to world events which can cause the stock market to take very sudden and drastic dips uh, such as 9-11 and uh, the recent Japanese earthquake. Uh, these risks can be overcome somewhat uh, if the company were to invest in so-called blue chip companies. Um, these are considered to be more strong financially um, with only a moderate amount of debt and therefore are classified as uh, less risky investments. Um, however, uh, as we've seen recently, uh, even these so, uh, blue chip companies aren't completely risk free. Um, for example, the shares in the Bank of Ireland recently plummeted drastically. Um, so therefore, it's still possible to sustain large losses from investing in these so-called safe shares. Um, it would therefore be recommended that the composition of assets within the scheme needs to be changed. Um, a pension scheme requires a uh, fixed income, and this is provided by the holding of bonds because these pay interest regularly. Uh, government bonds or gilts are assumed to be risk-free, and so some of the assets of the scheme should consist of these. Uh, corporate bonds are a similar concept. Um, there's a higher risk of default, but there's also a legal obligation for the company to pay out uh, to investors. Uh, for this reason, gilts and corporate bonds should make up a fairly large proportion of the company's asset portfolio. Uh, these lower risk options are necessary due to the number of pensions in the scheme, which means that a steady and liquid income is necessary. Um, we also carried out a sensitivity analysis. Um, because the assumptions that we have made affect the liability of the scheme. So um, we saw how adjusting these assumptions would affect our liability. Um, first of all, we have interest rate. So we can see how the liability fluctuates uh, if we change the interest rate. Uh, X is the interest rate that we used. And then we see how the interest rate ch uh, changes the liabilities um, if we use plus or minus 0.5%. Um, as you can see, um, when the interest rate is lowered, this increases our liability and whenever the inc interest rate is increased, this would decrease our liability. Um, the biggest change there is with the actives. Um, by decreasing the interest rate by 0.5%, it increases our liability by 15% and if we were to de uh, increase the uh, interest rate by 0.5%, this would uh, decrease our liability by around 12%. Uh, the valuation for the pensions liability or the pensioners liability is less sensitive because this value is only affected by the change in post retirement interest whereas deferreds and actives are affected by both changes. Um, we did the same thing for inflation, we allowed a change of plus or minus 0.5% because inflation is a constantly changing rate and so we felt it was necessary to examine how such variation of inflation rates would affect our valuation. Uh, so as you can see here, if we increase inflation by 0.5%, our liability will increase. And if we decrease inflation by 0.5%, the liability would decrease. Um, this graph here shows how the use of CPI instead of RPI for, um, would affect our valuation. And this will be discussed later in the cost saving analysis part uh, of our presentation. Uh, salary growth, uh, this graph here. Um, it may vary for two reasons. Uh, firstly, salary growth is traditionally kept in line with inflation. And since we have allowed for changes in the inflation rate, we have to also allow for the effect that this will have on salary growth. Uh, secondly, salary growth is very dependent on the company for which you're working and how they value increased experience in the job and also possible promotions. So we have allowed um, for salary increases of 4% and 5%. Uh, either side of the 4.5% that we used uh, in our valuation. Um, Ryan will now talk about the cost saving analysis we made in our valuation report. Uh, now I'm just going to talk about what actions the business could take to help benefit the pension scheme. Uh, this is a topical issue at, at the minute. The subject of retirement age is quite controversial. This is because it is argued that countries will need to raise the state retirement age if they hope to cover the increase in costs caused by ageing populations. 
This is why we choose to examine our valuations if the retirement age was to uh, increase by five years to 70, as you can see just in the top right. Um, another, another action the business could take would be to change their accrual rate. Uh, as people are living longer, many pension schemes are choosing to lower their accrual rate as a cost-saving measure. Uh, to examine how this would affect the revaluation uh, of the liabilities of the scheme, it was decided to change the accrual rate to 180. Um, also looking at the CAR and not percent future increase, uh, the values in the following table show the, end, uh, the effects of using CAR and not percent future increase along with the change in accrual rate. Uh, I've just taken a look at the graph in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, you can see how it represents how the changes affect the different liabilities. Uh, cost saving. In order to reduce the deficit, which is around 47 million over 10 years, we needed to reduce the contributions by pensions by 42.93%. As you can see from our sensitivity analysis, the changes to our assumptions that we already have tested do not cover the magnitude of this reduction. Changing, changing the accrual rate from 1 60th to 1 80th lower, lowered the future service valuation for active members by the scheme by 3%, <coughs> which is not a sufficient measure to remove the deficit. Increasing the applied interest rate of the investments lowers the amount of pension funding, allowing, however, investing with a higher interest rate would mean a more risky investment, and this would not be practical in a scheme of this size. Uh, we could try to remove the deficit over 15 years, but this would re require a 32.66% reduction in the pension funding. Uh, just in conclusion, the total liabilities for this pension scheme have been calculated as around 122 million, and the assets are held at 75 million. Uh, this means that there is a deficit of 47 million, and the current funding level for the scheme is only at 61.3%. Uh, the assets for the scheme currently consist of wholly of equity and recommendations have been made regarding changes that should be made to the composition of the asset portfolio. This will ensure that there is a more appropriate balance between riskier assets with a higher return and stable well, with a higher return and stable more liquid assets. Uh, the sensitivity analysis section of the evaluation report shows how adjustments to the assumptions made by the XYZ Actuarial Consultancy would affect the total liabilities of the scheme. Several benefits, se several benefit changes have been discussed which would reduce the deficit. The largest change in the deficit would result from changing the retirement age from 70 instead of 65. However, this is an issue that is out of control of the company. If the government were to raise the state retirement age, uh, then this would help clear the deficit faster. However, this is unlikely to happen for several years, if at all. The use of CPA instead of RPA, uh, 1 80th accrual rate and a CAR scheme are all measures that can be taken by the company to reduce the deficit. However, such changes to the benefits of the scheme will need to be accepted by the members of the scheme first, and it is, it is not certain that they would be willing to accept changes that would reduce the value of the pension they will receive or are receiving. Uh, in conclusion, considering the deficit of the scheme, there be, may be no option than to close the scheme off to new members as the company may struggle to increase the funding level to an appropriate level which would eliminate the deficit. Uh, that's all. Thanks for listening and if you have any questions.